Hello, DEVSA colleagues. I'm Shashi Kalanin Cook, coordinator of the Contextual Studies module at the Department of Jewelry Design and Manufacture, headed by Farida Nazir. My co authors and colleagues, Tato Khadebe, Kanya Tetwe, and Kaylin Ernst, are year coordinators at the Jewelry Department. In this paper, we recount our experiences and adaptations for online jewelry design teaching during South Africa's national COVID 19 lockdown beginning in March 2020. At UJ, the final week of first term was canceled and students went home, returning to online teaching. This experience alerted us to the potential for greater integration of 4IR technologies in our teaching. However, our title, Lost Connection, refers not only to the practicalities of online teaching in which connection was disrupted, but also to social disconnection and opportunities missed due to context-specific issues of inequality and access. This must be considered in relation to 4IR in South Africa, as it suggests a lingering relationship between coloniality and technocracy. The paper is interpretive, constructivist, drawing mainly on reflections by lecturers on teaching practice. Colleagues shared their challenges and, and lessons as events unfolded, and we abductively puzzled over their significance and the impact of COVID-19 for the future of jewelry design and manufacture education in South Africa. We delved into this reflexively using field and working notes, memory and embodied experience. We pooled our reflexive accounts and drew from them the themes presented in this paper. The lessons and possibilities of online teaching, staff and student well-being and resilience, and the relationship of coloniality with technocracy. As educators in a country that embraces technology and intends to keep up with global advances, we must develop and learn more about the technologies that work in our context. So we considered the possibilities for online teaching in our field. Katja Fleischmann explains that comparatively few fully online design courses exist, while other academic dif disciplines are experiencing rapid growth in this. Smaller studio-based classes form the bedrock of learning in many design contexts, according to Fleischmann, and this is true of our jewelry department. Learning jewelry techniques involves honing manufacturing hand skills and working with precious and semi-precious materials, workshop and bench equipment, tools and chemicals. Hands-on studio-based teaching is crucial. First-year lecturer Tato Khadebe literally holds a student's hand to, 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 to train them to solder. Metal preparation involves the use of expensive, specialized and potentially dangerous gas and oxygen systems installed and maintained by qualified professionals. The need for safety and resources makes it impossible for students to work unsupervised at home. To study this online, students would need a home workshop, free constant internet access, and a technician or safety monitor, as the substances and processes can be dangerous and the department could be held legally liable for accidents. Our challenge during lockdown was to adapt this heavily practical qualification to suit an online learning environment and keep students engaged. Initially, we focused on teaching theory, but with no end in sight to the lockdown, the need to awaken practical muscle memory grew pressing. We then introduced creative practice online using simulations, video demonstrations, YouTube tutorials, model making and time-lapse videos. Staff and students pushed the limits of their creativity using recycled materials, found objects and even clay making skills. Lecturers tasked students with producing videos where they, where they imagined themselves in a workshop environment and recorded themselves doing step-by-step -step simulations of the manufacturing process. This encouraged tacit learning because students used similar motions and thought processes as in a physical studio space. We propose that in future, jewelry design educators could explore using simulations in online learning. If students have access to virtual reality technology anywhere in the country, it would close the gap between manufacturing in the real and VR worlds. It's already possible to work on a model with VR and 3D printed at home, but the price of such tools is prohibitive. Soon, however, these methods might be normalized and more affordable, and we look toward that possibility, beginning with identifying open access computer-aided design and manufacturing programs. CAD and 3D printing are the biggest advancements in jewelry design, requiring software, hardware, and materials to work together to create physical objects by depositing materials in layers based on a digital model. Designing jewelry using 3D printers combines computer-aided precision with the tactility of a prototype to produce consistent symmetrical pieces without the tediousness and variability of wax carving. 
However, during lockdown, CAD classes were postponed because Rhino 7, the software used to teach the module, is licensed to the departmental computers. It costs around 14,000 Rand to buy it for individual, use, for individual use, beyond what most of our students can afford. So Khadebe investigated the use of open source CAD programs because the technology is freely downloadable and the plugins are mostly compatible. It is theoretically possible to run an open source CAD program called Blender on a smartphone, but Kharebe tested this and found it imp impractical in the current circumstances. The data needed to download the software was costly, the installation process was complex, and most students' devices lacked the memory to run them. If this were adopted for online learning, a high spec device would need to become another tool of the trade, in addition to manufacturing tools, which would increase overall costs. So we're heading in a useful direction, but we need time and resources, such as suitable applications and hardware to optimize this. We found that blended learning and jewelry design manufacturing was possible, um, as Fleischmann suggests, and some of our modules were teachable online. Due to time constraints, I'll only be able to discuss a few of our findings about blended learning, but the educational platforms, tools and methods we used were mainly WhatsApp Black and Blackboard. Um, Blackboard's recording functions and WhatsApp threads and transcripts made it easy for students to access and repeat a lecture. And also video demonstrations and YouTube tutorials helped in sharing practical tips. In terms of lecture content, it had to be self-explanatory and this actually strengthened, strengthened the quality of the learning materials we supplied. Also, the increased use of writing and reading boosted these proficiencies during lockdown. To convey a human touch and a bit of spontaneity, we used WhatsApp voice notes with enthusiastic tones and emojis, GIFs, and memes, which digitally, digitally represented facial expressions and body language. And here is a meme that one of my students particularly preferred. Um, flexibility and spontaneity in online teaching may be reduced if lectures become overly transmission focused. So dialogical communication should be maintained to create a responsive learning environment. Some of the advantages and lessons of online learning that we found was that physical lecture venues tend to place students facing forward at the lecturer, but an online group is more of a web or network of teachers and learners. While there's still a hierarchy and power dynamic because lecturers are setting topics for discussion, the constant feedback required from students signaling participation dilutes the sage on the stage tendency of some lecturers, and this chattiness has a vibrant quality as well. Uh, one interesting lesson was the studio crits, which are central, central to art and design feedback. Although intended to be interactive and inclusive, physical crits are often impractical. COVID-19 concerns aside, it's difficult for 20 people to gather around a piece and see it equally well. And as the physical crit wears on, some students become disinvested and hang back, not taking an interest. Lecturers' voices become dominant and students follow lecturers around without offering peers much feedback. However, wider visibility is afforded when sharing drawings and photographs of progress on WhatsApp groups. So using a digital component in physical studio crits may actually spark more peer feedback and encouragement. These lessons are applicable both in future emergency online teaching scenarios and under usual circumstances. However, some realities of online teaching need urgent attention. Conducting our curriculum digitally while our physical beings were scattered around the country made us appreciate the possibilities of 4IR. However, the writers of this paper all witnessed fees must fall and acknowledge high fee costs and financial inequalities between students. During lockdown, it was unnerving to find how many students were dependent on the campus Wi-Fi to do online submissions and communicate via electronic media. So initially some students just couldn't attend online. Most students couldn't afford the initial increase in mobile data fees before the free data bundle allocation. And some had extremely poor network coverage. Ignoring the realities of digital access in the quest to appear globally competitive may therefore perpetuate a survival of the fittest narrative and entrench historical inequality. Resource researchers from Melbourne, Australia describe their students as digitally native, as having been exposed to digital technology from a very young age and expecting their educational institutions to incorporate the latest technologies in their teaching and learning approaches. In a South African context, this may be applicable to financially privileged students or those from well-resourced schools, but it's not the case for most of our students. Internet access in rural areas is more limited in, than in metropolitan and urban areas. 
increasing difficulties for students applying to and engaging in higher education. Prior to lockdown, Stats South Africa found that only 10% of South African households had internet access at home, and predominantly in rural regions, this was less than 1%. We were also reminded of other inequalities stemming from South Africa's apartheid history, as it seemed that white students were more likely to have Wi-Fi at home. Many of our students were plunged back into the role of being digital strangers, students without direct campus or direct access off campus, who may own a mobile phone, but don't necessarily have internet access. Not all our students had access to a suitable device. Some were too faulty for sustained online work, such as writing essays. In response, we kept track of each student and used the means at our disposal to address problems by applying to NISFAS and using UJ's support systems to assist qualifying students to obtain loan devices. In cases of poor networks, students were allowed to submit work when their network access improved. Along with data and network disruption, ESCOM's load shedding schedule caused problems. Students purchased power banks, giving them half a day's battery life to submit daily tasks and maintain, maintain participation. This exemplifies the hurdles jumped to approximate business as usual, and it doesn't seem comparable to many situations in the global north. In his review of Klaus Schwab's book on the fourth industrial revolution, Jake Iforda is, explains that imagining having billions of people connected by smart devices with extraordinary processing power and access to data is exciting. However, Iforda feels a sense of despair and pessimism due to the gap that 4IR entrenches between resourced and unresourced context in almost every area of human development and agency. There are, four, almost four, there are 4 billion people in the third world who tend to lack reliable internet access, and nearly 1.3 billion people in Africa lack access to electricity. The problem rests not with the failure of the third world to catch up to 4IR, but how 4IR raises concerns around issues of power asymmetry, security, and the resulting threats of inequality, disempowerment, and exploitation. As institutions of higher education galvanize towards 4IR, these issues must be acknowledged. We need to be clear about what is available to students going forward and what we need if we're to integrate online innovation with real world realities. Living in RES helps some students to cope with and escape the harsh realities of home environments. During lockdown, many students struggled to focus due to noise, overcrowding or violent family dynamics, which fringed on their product, infringed on their productivity. Many are the first generation in their family to attend university, sometimes equating to lower levels of academic support at home. To juggle household chores and coursework, some students had to show their families their timetables and explain what online learning required or risk being perceived as uncooperative. Students were remarkable throughout this period, overleaping issues with bravery and showing incredible fortitude catching up. We praised their resilience. However, Adrian van Breda argues that the definition of resilience for the global South must consider the long-term effects and lifelong traumas of colonization, poverty, and gender-based violence. Van Breda argues that often in the global south, there's no end to adversity and that resilience narratives breed a culture of acceptance of difficulty as a normalized response to an unsupportive environment. Expecting students to accept and adapt to changes that don't consider their lived experiences may manifest as a form of silencing. In the classroom, lecturers may encounter resilient students who don't vocalize their difficulties because they're so accustomed to trying to overcome adversity. And this is true for staff as well. Setting clear boundaries between lecturers and students means respecting one another's family time and well-being by avoiding messaging on WhatsApp groups after office hours or on weekends. But this was upended during lockdown. Staff gave out their personal cell phone numbers and worked after hours with no expectations of increased compensation to accommodate load shedding and network issues. Students messaged at all hours of the day or night to, slip, to save data. Khadebe recounted that he had to change from lecturer to reassurer because first year students were only just getting settled into the new environment when we shifted online. Conveying a sense of security and stability with students was imperative, but in many cases, staff didn't really know if things would be okay. In the context of constant changes, lecturers' optimism, dedication, and hope stood in for certainty. After researching ways that jewelry design and manufacture might be fully facilitated online, we concluded that the resources cost required and the health and safety implications are presently prohibitive.
Our research could be advanced by exploring open access CAD programs and VR simulated learning and manufacturing, and further exploring the listed benefits of blended learning. Tackling issues of student resilience and staff dedication, um, consistently bridging systemic gaps, can be faced with a united front, which would help everyone to shoulder contextual challenges beyond the COVID-19 lockdowns. Thank you very much.